uh, present to you what we're calling Us and Them. Uh, not long ago, I had a conversation with um, the CAO, Mr. Gus McCoy, uh, about how we can create an opportunity for uh, law enforcement and community members to forge a relationship uh, that we believe will be beneficial in helping to stave off uh, a lot of the issues that we're seeing around our country today. Uh, what we understand very clearly is that uh, in the law enforcement community, they're no different than when I was working in schools. That there are amazing members of law enforcement, and then there are those who other law enforcement officials would much rather not represent them. Uh, it was the same way that I felt as a teacher when I was in a classroom doing all that I could to make sure that we impacted young people in the most uh, impactful way that we could. Uh, and there would be a teacher in the same building who did not have the same drive, passion, or motivation that I did. And so we also know that there's a constituency group that's served by law enforcement, the same way that there was a constituency group that was served by me as a teacher. And that constituency group uh, deserves uh, the best attention that we could possibly give them, but law enforcement also deserves uh, the best cooperation and understanding that they can get from the community. So we decided we would uh, attempt to bring uh, these two parties together. So we decided uh, about two years ago, Mr. McCoy and I, that we would work on a program uh, called Us and Them. You might be wondering why we're saying it Us and Them, because it sounds, uh, it sounds almost um, ri uh, like a rivalry, if you would. But actually, Us and Them speaks to the fact that there is, in a lot of cases, a situation where we see ourselves as us and them, and you decide who the us is. You can be the us or you can be the them, but in a lot of cases, that's how you've seen yourself. I remember Chief Vance growing up, and uh, my daddy, when I first started driving, my daddy taught me the rules uh, while driving black. The rules while driving black uh, was very simple. Uh, if you get pulled over by the police, you put your hand at 10 and 2, you get that window rolled down, you look straight ahead, you say yes sir and no sir, you don't make any sudden moves and you get home alive. To be honest with you, I've had the same conversation with my son as he gets ready to uh, go down the road of being a driver uh, in our community. Now does that say that my son will always encounter folks who are adversarial to him? who are in law enforcement uniforms? Absolutely not. But what it says is that there is still a need to have conversations with our young people and with our people in the community about how we interact with the police and with law enforcement. So today what we hope is that by having these different uh, members of the community, both law enforcement as well as community members, as well as moms, as well as uh, students, as well as folks who have had interactions with the police, want to generate some real honest conversation. I want to uh, probe them into saying the kinds of things uh, that need to be said in order to move this conversation along. Uh, and what we know is that we'll leave out of here today and we won't have all the answers. Everything won't be resolved. We won't um, know everything when we're done. But what we will be able to do is start this conversation and to start the dialogue. With that being said, I think that we have uh, the best moderator for that. He uh, knows how to probe. Uh, he even knows how to get on my nerves. That's why I called him. He is none other than Mr. Otha Kane. Uh, for those of you who are on Facebook or on other uh, social media outlets, you know that he pushes uh, conversation on almost every uh, civic and social topic. And so it's my pleasure to introduce your moderator for today, Mr. Otha Kane. So let me take this opportunity to say good evening to you. I'm excited to be here, I'm excited to be a part of uh, this conversation. Far too often we think that it can't or it won't happen uh, in Jackson, Mississippi. And I would submit to you that it absolutely could because in other parts of the country, uh, I am certain they thought the exact same thing. So us versus them, a conversation on race, black lives, and police. And I will say this, that throughout the evening tonight, I think that the city is Facebooking, uh, they're live streaming on Facebook tonight, so you can be certain to check that out. If you wanna use hashtags or anything like that, you can do that as well. And there are microphones in the aisles, and so we will certainly take 
questions from the audience throughout uh, this one hour conversation. So we won't hold them until the end. We'll take them uh, throughout the conversation. I'm very excited about the panel tonight. I am particularly uh, excited about the fact that there is a young person uh, on the panel. Far too often, as adults, we tend to think that we have all of the answers, right? We tend to think that we can give all of the information that's needed to really uh, move the needle or, or perpetuate the problem, if you would. But tonight, we do have a young person represented on the panel. We'll give this distinguished panel an opportunity to introduce themselves, uh, and their bios are so long, and that's why we're gonna let them uh, introduce themselves so that uh, as a moderator, I can cut them off without me having to read it all and get cut off. So having said that, we're gonna start with um, Ms. Brown, who is a uh, high school student. We're gonna give her an opportunity to introduce herself. I will say this about her. Her dad is a part of the Jackson Public School uh, system, and he is extremely supportive of her, and she has been on the front lines, really raising her voice about the whole Black Lives Matter movement and other issues that plague young people. But I don't wanna steal her thunder. I'll give her an opportunity to introduce herself. Good evening to you. Um, good evening, everyone. My name is Macy Brown, and I'm an incoming freshman at Jim Hill High School. Um, over the past few months, I've really been involved in the changing of the Mississippi State flag. In March, I wrote an article for the Jackson Free Press that generated a lot of buzz, which eventually led to me doing more rallies and really standing up for myself. So over this time, I've been featured in the Jackson Free Press, um, the USA Today, The Guardian, and the Associated Press. And because of my efforts with the state flag, I was able to travel to Washington, D.C. with actress Anjanou Ellis, Dr. Michael Eric Dyson, and many other distinguished guests who allowed me to speak my mind at the U.S. Capitol and also talk to other congressmen who are aware, who are aware of the issue but didn't know the effect that it had on its people. So tonight I'm here to just really show the public that we care. Um, show the media that children do keep up. Every time we're on Twitter or on Instagram, we're actually learning about what's going on because nine times out of 10, we learn what's going on from just scrolling down our phones. So I'm really just here to show that we care, um, black lives do matter, and to get the perspective of our respected officials. Thank you. All right, very good. Let's give her a round of applause as we welcome her uh, to the panel tonight. We'll move now to Minister Mahan. Good evening, assalamu alaikum. I'm Minister Dr. Abram Muhammad, State Representative of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, Nation of Islam, also an Honorable Discharge Vet from the United States Marine Corps, Combat Action Twice, and a former police officer in the Commonwealth of Virginia. My uh, great distinguished part of being here tonight is also to represent as the co-chair of the Jackson Faith Base Alliance, and I'm here to hopefully bring in part uh, the sentiments and the guidance of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan and also with my experience as wearing the shield and also being in the community as a community activist. So I'm looking forward to our dialogue tonight and I hope that we keep in mind that at the end of today that we're family, we're family, we're family. Thank you. All right, and we will move now to the Assistant uh, Chief of Police for the Jackson Police Department, Chief White. Good afternoon, my name is Alan White. I'm the Assistant Police Chief. I uh, work under the leadership of Chief Vance. I'm a 24-year veteran of the Jackson Police Department. I uh, started out in 1993 in Precinct 2 over in West Jackson. I was raised in Jackson. I went to Lee Elementary School. Witten Junior High School. We didn't have middle school back then. And I'm um, graduate of Jim Hill High School. <laughs> That's an A33 booing there, so you know how that goes. All right, so we'll move down now to uh, Chief Vance. And I will say this, one of the reasons I think that people feel so extremely comfortable saying that uh, situations probably like this that are happening across the country will not happen in Jackson is because of the likes of a Chief Vance uh, being homegrown, uh, being raised by this community, being in touch with this community, and really having a uh, strong passion 
uh, for what he does. But I won't steal his thunder. I'll give him an opportunity to uh, introduce himself and even acknowledge the one mistake that he made. Chief Vance. <laughs> Good evening. My name is Lee Vance. I'm a Jackson police officer for 28 years and 11 months. I'm very proud to be a member of this police department. I think I got the best job in the world, and I am very proud to be a Jacksonian. I think it's the greatest city in the world, and I'm very, very defensive about it, and I'm looking forward to the dialogue. Thank you very much. All right. Next up is Attorney Gail Lowry. Good afternoon. My name is Gail Wright Lowry. I'm a Jackson native as well. I'm a graduate of Mara High School, so welcome to Mustang Territory. I have been working for the city of Jackson since the year 2000. Uh, I started working uh, as an appointment as a municipal court judge. I served in that position for nearly 14 years. After that, I came to the office of the city attorney, where I presently serve as special assistant to the city attorney. Also, the role that I play here tonight is that the mayor, about four months, commissioned a criminal justice reform task force and basically told me and the chief that we would chair that organization. So I sit here anxious, ready, excited about hearing from the community that I love and hoping that this will be the beginning of a continual conversation. Thank you. All right, Gail, thank you very much. Next up on the panel, this brother has a remarkable story, um, and, and he touches the heart, the hearts of a lot of young people across this city. And I'm going to let him tell you who he is and what he does. Good evening. <laughs> My name is John Knight. I'm the director of Jackson Carroll's Incorporated and also the Undivided Peace Movement. And uh, I'm a Jim Hill product. I was born and raised in West Jackson. And I, I was asked to be here because I'm one of those guys that used to be the us against them. You know, I learned my lesson through our hard times of back and forth to prison that people in my position that, that people look up to or have been looking up to for so many years, if I led them to do wrong, there's no way in the world I can lead them to do the right thing and keep them from doing and making the mistakes that I made and going down the roads I went down. So that's my purpose of being called here to let these officers know that we're not against them. It's just the way we was raised and the way the streets taught us about the law enforcement and these new law enforcement officers now, the good guys, we're not used to good cops. And that's the reason I'm here, to let them know that it's people out there that believe in them and they're with them. Every black person is not a bad person. Every young black man with his pants down is not a thug. And we gotta get away from that stereotypical thing that has been on us for so many years and that's what I'm here for to let them know, to hear my voice from the hood perspective. All right, John, thank you very much. We look forward to more um, information and dissemination from you tonight. Next up is a very good friend of mine. She works uh, with the Children's Defense Fund, a lot of policy work. Uh, her background, though, is so very even with that. Uh, Kim Robinson is next. Not a background in child advocacy, that's for sure. I have a background in finance. My name is Kim Robinson. Um, I have been with the Children's Defense Fund Southern Regional Office proudly for 13 years under the leadership of Marion Wright Edelman and my mentor and daily inspiration, uh, Alita Garrett Fitzgerald. I'm a mom, uh, one successful graduate from JPS, um, from Jim Hill High School, um, IB diploma, Graduated, full scholarship, Jackson State University, presidential scholar, W.E.B. Du Bois. <laughs> so, um, and I have an incoming freshman this year at Murrah, so the juxtaposition of that is a lot to unpack. Um, I am the program manager over national initiatives for the Children's Defense Fund. I do policy work on education, juvenile justice, health, um, and ev everything that families and children need in communities. Um, and I also work with Freedom Schools, which is a program that's modeled after the 1964 Freedom Summer that happened right here in Mississippi. 
Thank you. All right, Kim, thank you. Looking forward to sharing with you a little bit more tonight. Next up is the top cop uh, for the county, the sheriff of, for Hines County. Uh, sheriff Victor Mason has a extreme diverse background in law enforcement. He too is homegrown and has participated in law enforcement for a number of years. He has particular uh, training and gains. He's been uh, facilitating workshops along those lines for a number of years. And he is a member of the amazing institutional church of God in Christ. I just have to put that plug in. Sheriff. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. I'm, uh, like he said, homegrown. I'm gonna go ahead and burn this bridge now. I'm a proud graduate of Callaway High School. Finally, somebody say praise the Lord. Way. See, wait, I know, I know. But I'm here because I care. I'm here because we need to talk. We need to just set the record straight. And hopefully tonight, we can get some raw conversation out and we can all leave together with a good feeling about law enforcement as us can have a good feeling about you and what your needs are and what you want. Thank you so much. All right, very good. Thank you, Sheriff. We look forward to sharing uh, more with you tonight. And finally, uh, making uh, up our uh, distinguished panel is Chief Thompson. I'm uh, Luke Thompson, Chief of Police for the City of Byron. Uh, born and raised in Byron, just south of, of Jackson. Uh, spent my younger years growing up in South Jackson. Um, I'm the city's first police chief. Uh, we started our department uh, just six years ago. I also serve as the chair for the Mississippi Law Enforcement Accreditation Commission. Um, those agencies, law enforcement agencies throughout our state that seek to uh, work at a higher standard, uh, we oversee those standards uh, to make sure that they are based on current best practices. Um, and we work real hard to help agencies develop good current policy um, to provide the best police services uh, in their communities. All right, very good. Let's give our panel a big round of applause. Chief Thompson, we're going to stay right there with you as we begin this conversation. Remember, if you have questions, just uh, show yourselves uh, to the mic and we'll uh, certainly address those. So tonight, let's start with uh, defining the problem in your uh, capacity as Chief of Byron and, and understanding uh, the current climate of the country. Uh, and when you merge that with what's happening in uh, Mississippi, Hines County, what do you think the problem is? Well, and thank you for the opportunity to, to answer that question. One of the things, um, when the tragedy occurred in Ferguson, Missouri, I had the discussion with a number of, of other folks, and looking at our community, compared to Ferguson, Missouri, I noticed a lot of similarities in the makeups of those communities, uh, in, in our respective communities. And one of the things that stuck out was the involvement of the police department in the community. Um, one thing I noticed personally was that the Ferguson, Missouri Police Department was not very well connected. And there was a fundamental disconnect uh, with the community and the police department. One of the things that we have, have strived to do since then is to reconnect uh, and, and make connections that didn't exist before. Law enforcement serves as a function of the community. We're not separate from the community. Uh, we are in the community. I, I tell uh, our officers all the time, be present in the community, don't just drive through the community. Uh, and as officers develop those relationships, um, we are the most visual representation of the government. Um, and there are those that have the sentiment against any government. Uh, so, Police work is a, as in many other business settings, it is a, it is a people business. It is relationship based. We have to have relationships with our residents. We have to have relationships with our business owners. We have to have relationships with all of those that interact in and out of our communities on a daily basis. And, and that is uh, probably, I, I believe, one of the most crucial aspects. Uh, mutual respect. Um, is just that it, it is a it is a give and take and and you cannot wait for a tragedy to happen to have those connections All right, very good. I uh, shall face Would you agree with that as uh, being? Uh, the nucleus if you would of the problem you have to be you have to be it You can't stay locked up in the office all day uh, As most of you know, I was a 
juvenile investigator for many years, actually since 1984. And if I didn't speak at your school, I spoke at your church. And that was one of the things that I believe helped, helped me was to understand where young people were coming from. Being an only child from a single parent home, I didn't get everything I wanted. But at the same time, I can feel and see what they're coming from. So I have a lot of empathy for that. Uh, it bothers me when I see a 14-year-old that's in jail for armed robbery. And it bothers me also when he's being raised by a single parent with four other children because she has to go to work. So when you look at that, we have to be, as I've said over and over, we have to be servants. We have to come in front of the badge and be friends. And I think once we get out of the cars and go to the houses and sit down and talk to them, and, and I think that will start the healing process. But if, if we don't have that direct communication with the family, if we don't have that direct understanding that we are not here to lock you up, but to keep you up and, and just be father figures and mother figures, we'll never get anywhere. All right, very good. Let's stay uh, with the perspective from law enforcement. Chief Vance, you take a step at that question, uh, defining uh, from your vantage point what you see as the problem. Well, let me, let me preface what I'm going to say uh, by uh, my remarks about Ferguson. It's basically coming from what I've seen and heard through the media. Quite frankly, I had never heard of Ferguson, Missouri before this incident with Mr. Brown. But let me assure y'all of this. Those uh, results that occurred there were much more complicated than one man's death. It's the result of a culture that had probably existed there for a long time. Mm -hmm. uh, to piggyback off what Luke said, if there is no relationship between law enforcement and the community, then those type of ill feelings will fester. Um, and quite frankly, we have to discuss the fact that race has been an issue in this country since its inception. It's simply a matter of how we decide to move forward. We also have to realize that in the United States of America, we do not have a national police service. Uh, just to mention one, the Republic of South Africa has one. We don't have one here that does localized policing. We have the FBI, DEA from the federal level, but localized, I mean, the street policing, neighborhood policing, is left to local entities. Also in this country, there is about 18,000 police jurisdictions that operate independent of each other. Doesn't mean one is better, doesn't necessarily mean one is worse, but they're probably different because you've got a different set of priorities, a different culture, in Jackson, I've been in this business since 1987. And I've been around long enough to know, I ain't been around as long as Vic, but I've been around long enough to know the difference between the way things used to be done and the way they're done now if you're wise. If you're wise, you must adopt a community-oriented policing concept. Now you can ask 10 different people and get 10 definitions about what that is, but I'm gonna tell you basically all it is. It's an attitude adjustment on the part of law enforcement, which basically says we're going to reach out to the community in many ways, and we wanna partner with the community. We wanna be seen as servants within the community. We don't wanna be seen as invading armies, we don't want to be seen only when we're doing enforcement. There must be outreach, there must be partnerships. The police must be seen 
as a part of the community. The national rhetoric as it relates to these matters, and many times, and I don't even know if it's intentional, is divisive by definition. If you say the police, who are you talking about? I've never even been to Ferguson, never been to Minnesota, have not been to New York, do not know the chiefs of police in those particular cities, have not ever met them. So certainly, I cannot be synonymous with whatever their philosophies are. We don't practice from the same manual. The laws are different, the ordinances are different, but most importantly, the cultures are different. If you are in a, a, a police culture that allows abuse, then that's going to manifest itself. If you are in a police culture that despises abuse, then the community will trust you. Because that's all it is, is trust and respect. One other point. When these things happen, and they get into, let's say, the other parts of the criminal justice system, the court system. In some places, uh, there is no trust that justice can be done on the local level because they, it is said and it is believed, and sometimes it's probably true, that everybody works together, we all know each other, we all buddy around together, so there cannot be any objectivity. So then one size doesn't fit all when it comes to law enforcement uh, agencies across the country. That's 100% correct. And, and one other thing, I know I said one other thing three or four times. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to hold you to it this time uh, with the fear of being arrested. Let me, let, me, let me break this down. I do not, never have condoned police brutality. We don't allow it in our department. When we find out about it, we will hold those individuals accountable. But when you start saying the police, and you attach that to everyone in this country that happens to be in that profession, that's the same thing that Donald Trump did when he implied all Muslims were terrorists. It's never good to group anybody, put everybody in one basket. These instances have to be localized, and they have to be dealt with in each particular department. Thank you. All right, very good. Chief White, do you have anything to add to that before we take um, a different perspective? It's kind of hard to come behind that. What I would just like to add, and I can break it down a little uh, more specific for our department and our city, we preach customer service on a weekly basis, a daily basis in some <coughs> cases, and uh, we hold our officers to that standard. Uh, you know, it's just like when you go to a restaurant, I'll use Chief Vance's uh, saying on this, and you order a steak, if you're not satisfied with that steak, you're not going to jump on the waiter. You, want, you need to ask to see the manager of the restaurant. Tell them your steak's not right. And that's what, that's what we do here in Jackson. If you're not satisfied with the police service that you're getting, ask for a supervisor. That's why we pay them. That's why we have supervisors because they're frontline supervisors and they take care of those issues at hand. But uh, that, that's what I could add. All right, very good. John, I would uh, want to give you an opportunity now to take a stab at that. What would you define as the problem or how would you define the problem? Oh, well, first and foremost, ignorance plays a lot of the problems in situations with uh, citizens and uh, police. And uh, a, lot of, a lot of black people are not told what their rights are, are not real their rights, are not schooled about policing. You know, it's good, I agree with everything they're saying about being present in the hood, being uh, talking to the neighbors, but that's not gonna be enough. You gotta gain the trust back from the community that was lost before you are doing certain situations. And see, when I say the trust back is when we see police come out there, or they pull up and jump out of the cars, it's always aggression. So the kids that come up, when I was out there in the streets, when uh, the sheriff was, the game where he chased me a lot. 
Because I was a young gang baby, 12 years old. So I've been knowing him a long time. I've been running from him a long time. You know, <laughs> so, <laughs> so the, the thing it is, when you see that, when you see another person get beat up by the police, or slammed down his face for a traffic ticket, or no driver license, or cause he wouldn't answer a certain question, they make you have a little strife that's towards the officer if you see them. Especially if you see that car come up, there he go, man, he do this and he do that. And just like people in neighborhoods, officers are the same way. Y'all are an organization, y'all just police. So if, if it's two officers come and there's only one beating you up, the other one not going to tell him to stop. He's going to back him up. So when my report goes, when I say, well, he did this or that to me, it's a cover up. You know, and that's what America, well, I can say Jackson. I ain't been all over America. That's what Jackson, that's what the problem is in Jackson communities with law enforcement officers. Because I had a problem with them when I was us against them. You know, because I've been beat up plenty of times for the simplest thing, not stopping on, not signal lighting, you know, it's just, it's, when you have that aggression for so many years and see it, it takes time and dedication to actually get our trust back. And that's, I don't worry about uh, law enforcement anymore like I used to, because I'm not the same person I used to be, but it's still an issue in my community. And certain officers have been banned from patrolling in my neighborhood this year for harassing people and just pulling people over and doing things of that nature. You know, and that's, that's sometimes that's good because that person's car could be stolen, the tag could be out, and that's a probable cause, you know? And it's just so many stipulations for a community or neighborhood patrolling that leaves us helpless to defend ourselves. And if you go to Turner Ferris, it seems like they with them because you never hear anything else about it. Or they'll pull up an old record. So it's a lot of things dealing with the system of policing, the judges, the sentencing, orders, and everything that's just unheard of and nobody wants to hear because they are not that person. And you know, that's, that's the real problem in our community with the police. You know, and it's, it's something that can be fixed. It's not something that's gonna take forever to fix if it's addressed, if people listen. The chief and the sheriff, they listen. I've talked to them, our mayor, he listened. These people, I'm saying, they listen. But you have to get the trust of your community. And when I say the trust, that don't mean just riding up with a convoy, get out, shake hands, and take pictures. That's not trust. You have to have a bond with community. You have to have a bond. You know, if you don't have a bond, nothing is gonna work. All right, very good. Let's, I'm going to get to your question in one second. Let's get a young person's perspective on this, and then we're going to uh, get to your question, and then we're going to get to uh, policy and court uh, perspective. Uh, Ms. Brown, how would you define the problem? Um, I have to agree largely, largely with Mr. Knight's perspective. Um, this distrust of police in the African-American community did not just start when Trayvon Martin was killed in cold blood. This dates back hundreds of years back to slavery days when you had slave patrols that had badges like a police department. And they were making sure that slaves slaves where they were supposed to stay and made sure they knew they were property. So when you have those things going on and over the years during the civil rights movement, your policemen were spraying you with fire hoses and kicking you to the curb and letting dogs eat you. So if somebody's constantly doing these things to you over generations and generations, there's obviously going to be a distrust mentally and subconsciously, even if they do come and shake your hand and take pictures, what your mother and your grandmother, or if you're a young, if you're a young man, your father and your grandfather instilled in you to look at these group of people a certain way, you can't help but subconsciously do it. So I think that it's something that the police can help, but it really starts in our own community and really teaching our others and teaching our family members to gain trust because that's the only way that the years of damage can be undone. All right, very good, very good. Let's give her a round of applause. And I'm hearing a build up over time. Uh, these problems are escalating. Let's take a question from the audience at this point. Um, we talk about relationships between the police and the community. One of the questions that I would ask is, uh, recently there was a young man that died in jail and there was questions about what had happened. And it took a long, long time to get that information to the community. 
And, and in light of all the other things that were going on in the community, that did not help to um, create that relationship. How do we fix those kinds of situations? That's a very good question. The only thing worse than delayed information is bogus information. There are just certain law enforcement procedures that take time. When that particular incident occurred, without getting into too much detail about it, what we decided to do was have another agency investigate it. Because what we were, were trying to avoid is the appearances of any type of collusion or cover-up. So we called the state in, and we turned the entire investigation over to the state. Now, there, there are certain things that just take a while because in the state of Mississippi, we've got some logistical issues as far as, and I'll just be specific on this point, toxicology, for instance. In an investigation like that, a toxicology report was necessary. So we called the state in to do the investigation. The toxicology report was very crucial as far as getting a determination of what actually happened. But we had turned the investigation over to another agency. So they have to work within the resources that they had. And it took them a long time to get the toxicology report back. But if, if, if God forbid an incident like that happened again, I would do it exactly the same way because by turning it over to an independent agency and letting them investigate it, I still think there's a better, uh, that there's, there was an effort to make sure that there was not an appearance of any type of cover up. And that's, what, that's, that's why that happened and that's why it took so long.